special representative for the Horn of Africa, but also uh, Mr. Jens Peter Kjemperud of the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. My name is uh, Johan Harald Sandeli. I'm a senior researcher here at the uh, NUPI, and I will be chairing this event. Uh, I also have to inform you that uh, this event is being uh, taped and streamed online. So, the Horn of Africa is a historically a very significant region where um, regional politics and re regime change seem to have um, mirrored the changes in the global politics and geopolitics. And today, the region comprises what we tend to call both developed states and more fragile ones, some of which have seen a remarkable economic and development um, uh, expansion over the last decade. But while their individual situation is relatively stable, they are potentially receptive to internal or external shocks which may have both national and regional effects. And the Horn is a very complex and diverse region. And the traditional understanding is that it includes Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, and Somalia. But often now, uh, the Horn is uh, perceived to stretch beyond these uh, countries, also to include South Sudan, Sudan, Uganda, and even Kenya, as illustrated by Mr. Rondo's uh, mandate but also for more tra tra transnational in initiatives of IGAD and the East African um, Community of Federation. <clears throat> so approaching peace, security, and development concerns in the Greater Horn of Africa needs to be contextualized and tailor-made. And I feel to mention that at the NUPI, we're just starting a large project funded by uh, the Horizon 2020 program of the EU. Uh, this project called the e Unpacked attends to EU crisis me response mechanisms in order to improve the conflict sensitivity and effectiveness. Comprehensive regional uh, approaches are much needed. What happens in one place have effects and repercussions to other areas, be it the contraband activities in Togo Vachala on the border of uh, Ethiopia and Somalia and Somaliland, the refugee and conflict formation in the, in the um, Gambela region, the Somali uh, Al-Shabaab waging attacks in Kenya and, uh, or Uganda, or the dam construction on the Nile affecting downstream countries. These are local and national concerns that may have different uh, regional spillover effects. They demonstrate not only how the region is intertwined, they also raise question whether the international system is sufficiently constructed and equipped to address these transnational concerns. While many problems in practice are transnational, the international system still address them via, largely via the nation state, which makes cross-border activities a bit more challenging. And of course, the EU has experience uh, regarding this, uh, these approaches from, uh, from home. But how does it act on the regional dimensions of conflicts abroad? Are international engagement to regional concerns confined by the nation state, and a regional engagement left to the regional actors, such as IGAD and the EAC? I will, of course, leave to Mr. Alexander Rondos to reflect uh, perhaps on some of these issues. But first, I will give the floor to uh, Mr. Jens Petter Kjemperu of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, who will provide, also provide some introductory comments and also introduce Mr. Alexander Rondos. So thank you. And after this, we will open the floor for, for questions and answers. Thank you. I, I won't have uh, make uh, many introductory remarks because I, I'll leave that for uh, for for Alex Rondos to um, um, to elaborate on. But just as we were going in, uh, I got a phone from from Cuba saying that uh, the government has gone back on its uh, promise to uh, allow uh, Riyad Mashar in with his 75 pe uh, people, which was supposed to arrive in in Cuba today. They now say he will only be allowed to have 40 people. So his his return to Cuba is again delayed. And the reaction is that uh, uh, all the IGAD countries will now start mobilizing, which is, uh, I mean, which proves, I mean, without the region, uh, you won't, uh, you won't achieve anything. But again, it's um, it's it's delayed. I, I just wanted to to uh, use that that as an example of uh, how the um, uh, region is absolutely necessary to to resolve any of the conflicts in the whole. Um, I've been given the honor to introduce my good colleague and uh, co-envoy, Alexander Rondos. Um, he has a long international career. I'm 
know, I mean, most of you are able to Google and uh, might have done that, but uh, he, and he has um, a distinguished career also, um, or from NGO business to World Bank duty and a distinguished career for the Greek government, uh, including as an envoy of the Prime Minister Papandreou in the Balkan and the Middle East. Uh, he was an, uh, appointed as the EU Special Representative to the Horn of Africa in 2011. Alex is a diplomat, but not an ordinary diplomat. Uh, where others scratch the surface, he digs beneath. Where others meet the obvious people in position, he also meets the people pulling the strings and others. Where others propose traditional solutions, he thinks out of the box. He moves where others dare not move. Um, Diplomats will claim he's a diplomat. Academicians will claim he's an academician. Politicians will claim he's a politician. But he's not the jack of all trades. He's the real thing in all three areas. And I think he will prove that by, your in, by his, introduction, his um, presentation here today. Alex, welcome. Thank you, Thank you Jasper. Thank you very much, Jens Peter, and thank you all for the, for the invitation to come and speak here. Um, <clears throat> so, Jens Peter, you've given me an interesting challenge. Uh, I can fly across the surface like a dilettante and now and then dip in a bit and see what we can come up with. Um, I, I want to focus, if I may, on what I would call the, the region itself. I, I will dip in occasionally and talk about one or two countries in the region of the Horn as illustrations of a wider issue. But I want to sort of speak to this region. To what extent is it a region and can it operate as a region economically, politically, and otherwise? And then how this region situates itself in, um, in a much wider international context. And there's a reason why uh, I've been lately focusing on this in, in my own duties. I'm, at the end of the day, from a point of view of policy, what one wants is individual countries in Africa and regions within Africa, and eventually Africa, to be in a position where economically, politically, security-wise, it stands up on its own. I don't see, say that out of a sentiment of you know, polite pan-Africanism and the like. It's not that. I happen to be sympathetic to it. But it's rather that it is in Africa's interests, and it's in all our interests, that Africa is able to become genuinely independent, genuinely decolonized. Okay? This is the fundamental objective. And anyone who doesn't see that as something that should be natural, right, and proper, well, it's certainly on the other side of the aisle from me. And I think that's the basis of both interests and objectives. So if then one looks at this region that we call the Horn, <coughs> excuse me, the question then is, where is the Horn on this particular trajectory? Trajectory towards a greater consolidation I'm not talking about a theoretical union, but a greater consolidation where the whole becomes greater than the sum of its parts in a region, and where this region is able, if I may put it this way, to deal with the world by not selling itself cheaply on the marketplace. Okay, and this comes in various forms. The first is, in terms of projects, is it negotiating its projects in the right way with various investors? Is there a way in which the region, as opposed to individual nations, can be and can leverage itself with the outside world? Is this a region which is able to find a way of not rushing to whoever is the first person with something to offer? and that they offer it cheaply and with minimum conditions and the like. In other words, this is about how do you become a region with the strength, power, not to have to just retail who you are 
cheaply on the marketplace. Why am I saying this? Because I happen to believe that the region is not there yet. And we need to be very honest about this. This region is still subject to internal divisions within countries, among countries, and therefore susceptible to the exploitation and depredations of whoever wants to go surfing from outside in this region. And I mean anyone, from whether it is ideological interests that may come from points east, and they could be religious or otherwise, it can be organized crime, it can be commercial interests who are getting arranging for deals that are frankly exploitative in many countries and in which elites in some of these countries collaborate in those deals. So we can go through this list. This to me is, these are some of the checklist of how you rise from being an individual country with more organized, within an organized region, able to negotiate and leverage your authority and power and thus protect yourself better. So where are we then? If, if that is the objective and I'm saying we're not there, I hope I've at least set out what I would consider to be certain um, criteria. First, we've got to be very realistic about a region which is comprised of whose diversity, if I may put it that way, is something quite ex astonishing and yet quite thrilling and yet utterly daunting. This is a crossroads of cultures, of religions. It is an ethnic crossroads. Okay. It is an historical crossroads. Anyone who thinks that what's happening now is new, go back and read what was happening in 4, 5, 600 BC which was about the relationship between Adulis, the Ptolemies, and the, and the kingdoms, and the Jewish kingdoms of, of, of Yemen. I mean, this, in some ways, there's some fascinating repetitions, but the contacts are there. It's been going on for years, and it certainly long predates the arrival of any European in that part of the world, and will probably post-date uh, the presence of any European there. So you've got this deep diversity, identities that, that, if you will, go deep. The roots are incredibly deep. It doesn't matter how they've been shake, shaken by events, by colonialism and wars. <clears throat> Therefore, in this context, we have countries with very mixed legacies, different ideological traditions. Sudan emerged as an independent country, and today's Sudan has a completely different political pedigree to, let's say, Ethiopia's. Okay? The paradox is that the closest pedigree to Ethiopia's is Eritrea's, and they're the two countries in the region who won't even talk to each other. Um, here are these paradoxes of the region. You have Kenya, which emerges from a certain colonial tradition and is the nearest thing to a free market system you're going to have. Um, which is something you can't say about, let's say, Ethiopia, which has taken a completely different path down towards the developmental state. So if we have these, and I don't dare go at the moment to South Sudan, which unfortunately is a case of tragic regret, but which we have to turn into something and help turn into something, um, which gives hope uh, to, to the people. Now, if we've got that sense of diversity, and different traditions, what is it that one can do to begin to say that this region could perhaps begin to integrate more? Okay. What are the obstacles? What are the opportunities? Now, there's some who may say, you know, why, why go on about integration? Well, actually, it's just, it's economics. Uh, uh, the bigger the market, the better off everyone can be. Th there's a sort of an economic logic to this. Uh, Somalia will make more by being able to link up better with the, with the markets of Ethiopia and Kenya, and we can look around the whole region. If one day eventually Sudan is able to open up and is no longer isolated in the way it is financially, you then have a much bigger region. In order to achieve that, you need real infrastructure. To me, it is absolutely astonishing that from Masawa, 
to Mombasa, the only port that really works for a population of five, about 400 million into the hinterland is Djibouti. Okay, and it, it, it and it is the lifeline for Ethiopia at the moment. But this in pure, it, there's a, it's a nonsense when you think strategically and in terms of economic development. Asab and the Eritrean issues we know, isolated at the moment, but it's, it's almost a, an inevitability that one day they will become extant ports again, servicing a hinterland. Berbera, Bosaso, Kismayo, all will be developed and linking into this region. We know that hydropower and hydrocarbons in this region are what I would call, if I may use a, a very loose historical analogy, if you will, the coal and steel of the horn. If they're properly exploited and the benefits therefrom are properly redistributed, which gets us back to the polit political economy of the region. Will this happen or will the thieves run amok? If I may be blunt and on the record on it because that's the fundamental issue. If we can get through that, and this region begins to exploit these resources, but in a way where I mean exploit in the best sense of the word, so that there is the social return, the political return, and it avoids the curse of natural resources, which I always find to be, my own view of that is whenever I hear, you know, oh, beware, they should be careful, you know, the curse of natural resources, I find utterly condescending, demeaning, if not racist. Why shouldn't African countries take the resources and hopefully manage them well? I can think of one or two countries that I know, not least my own, which has been blessed with many resources, I happen to be a Greek, and has managed to waste them. Curse comes in many forms, and there's no African monopoly on that. So how can we get the, European, the, 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 the region of, of EGAD to begin to think through how it deals with the natural resources? How do we link that to the infrastructure and build the infrastructure? How then do we get to the fundamental question, which is how to, how to address the political obstacles to development and to regional development? I'll put it to you in two ways. One is if you're a serious investor and you're looking at strategic projects and you're private sector and you want to say, I've got, I can put in a billion. The first question you're gonna ask is political risk. Do the politics of the region detract from the sustainability of an investment? And in many ways, there are gonna be a lot of questions because there's barely a frontier that isn't got some flashpoint on it because this region conducts its relations among itself, not yet in a cycle of positive cooperation, but in a cycle of deterrence. It is absolutely no secret that everyone has proxies on the other side of the frontier. In academic terms, it's called buffer zone strategy. To have a buffer zone means you've got to own it, control it, buy it off, or whatever you do in order to have influence on the neighbor. So how do you flip what is really a negative incentive to a positive incentive in regional relations? How do you take a series of frontiers that are fluid, utterly porous, but which now are beginning, the evidence is showing, sit on very significant reserves of some natural resources? And how do you make sure that in those regions along frontiers, which tend to be populated by often the more marginalized of the countries, that those areas don't become exploited by whomever and become points of competition and violence? These are some of the tests here that we have to really climb through. How, at the end of the day, do you get a region to say, if we get together, find a way of cutting through some of this, the, the undergrowth, um, there's a way of significantly increasing 
the, the wealth that is available for redistribution within the region. I think these are some of the, the questions we have to ask. And again, by asking them, I'm saying that we're not there yet by any means. But I'm also saying it is the challenge because that is the way we start thinking through creative ways of handling the, these challenges. We have a, we're dealing with a region in which Somalia is still on a long journey to its own restoration and rejuvenation. Okay? I think it's a lot better than where it was. I think there are lots of things that could have been done differently, but it is in a better place now than where it was. And I'll be very interested to hear comments from, from all of you. But he, one thing is interesting in Somalia, which is very controversial, it is the neighbors who decided at the end of the day to intervene, whether now it is under the hat of the Europe African Union, it is nevertheless the neighbors who have decided that they need to intervene in Somalia. Why? Because they felt that this was beginning to become a threat to them, so they get involved in. Good or bad, it's happened. So how does one manage one's way to the next stage? South Sudan today is sadly um, a lethal sort of shell of a country. And we've got to see, again, will the neighbors who are going to be the first to be affected, the incidents that occurred in Gambela a few days ago, are the first indication of how the South Sudanese fragmentation has begun to spill over a frontier. You, if you're in that neighboring country, you've got no choice but to take action. So what action is needed? I'm very clear and always have been that neighbors have a right and interest to organize themselves as frontline states, just as the frontline states did on South Africa 25, 30 years ago. So today you have frontline states on Somalia, on South Sudan, who have an interest. How do they engage in a way that will be constructive, in a way that can meet with international approval and legal approval? Okay, these are, these are the challenges. So we're here I am on the one hand talking to you about the potential of a region which you can build up through, you know, with investment and the like. But then the reality is you've got a Somalia which still has a long way to go. I happen to be totally convinced that if Somalia was left to the private sector with a few politicians just making sure some things work, it would be booming, my own view. I have nothing more than the greatest admiration for the Somali business sector. And we internationals tend to deal always with the politicians and the security instead of turning to the private sector of Somalia, which is incredibly active and very creative. South Sudan is another crisis. Eritrea is a big unknown, huge unknown. What's really going to happen there? What is this country? It's Again, we have isolated it. Has it isolated itself? We can get into that debate. And yet, if we don't address these issues with a view to saying, with a view to, without looking at the whole region, we will, I think, fail ourselves, and we run the risk of negotiating the creation of a Pachemkin village. Why? Because you can try and resolve something in South Sudan, but if you don't really make sure the neighbors are on board to make this a better place, it will be nothing more than possibly a rather fragile place, but never fully embedded in something that is a more constructive future. The same can be said for Somalia. The same can be said of each country of the other. That is why I come back constantly to this regional approach. We therefore have to have a strategy for the region that links the, the future and potential of infrastructure development, the wealth generators, with the political discussion. Because if we, go into those, if we don't link those two, and if you will, create cycles of incentives, we will end up having two theoretical discussions, one about how we overcome conflicts and another about how we make the place richer. But in fact, conflict and wealth go hand in hand. Address the conflict, wealth will come. And you've got to synchronize it. it. 
It's that's the political momentum you build around generating a great project. Now, so that's the region. But in the meantime, this region with its, if you will, fragilities and weaknesses happens to be at the, not the epicenter, but right there on the edges of one of the biggest storms going on globally. And that storm is the battle, if I may put it, as a non-Muslim over the soul of Islam, over what is the future of the identity of Islam. It's the Sunni Shia. It's the different strands of Islam, of, of Sunni Islam, that are playing themselves out. I won't go into the details. You all know it. We live with it in Syria, in Iraq, Libya, wherever else. It has now spilled over into the Horn of Africa. Now, before I, I go a little more into that, I want to be very clear about one thing, because it was suggested earlier, and I, I want to be clear. As, as a, a representative of the European Union, we all as Europeans, we have a vital stake here. The, the artery through which much of the trade and therefore jobs that are created runs through the Red Sea. The Red Sea is bounded on the one side by the countries of the Horn plus Egypt and on the other by Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Yemen is aflame. Somalia is porous and flat, fragile. Eritrea controls 600 kilometers 600, 1,000 kilometers of the Red Sea, about which we know nothing. Sudan controls a further few hundred. Okay. That's the geography. This artery, this jugular, is probably the least protected it has been in many, many years. That is our commercial lifeline, unless shippers decide to go for the much more expensive route around the Get Cape of Good Hope. The collapse of shipping through the Red Sea affects Europe immediately. It will have a devastating effect on the economy of Egypt. And we can go through all sorts of other issues. So what we have is this artery is now endangered by a set of developments, not deliberately, but it is the unintended consequences of of a series of competitions and conflicts. And it, and it should be the most galvanizing issue for European interests. What has been happening in the last two or three years, but it's accelerated lately, and in my experience, after four years of being a special representative of the European Union in this region, I would say that the game-changing development strategically has been the way in which the um, countries of the Gulf primarily have engaged themselves in the Horn. They've done it because the Horn of Africa, and I mean, I, I, I don't include Egypt as Horn of Africa, but this geographical space from Egypt down to Kenya is in many ways their neighborhood, historically, and it is now. And we in Europe always talk about neighborhood policy. Well, hello, other places also have neighborhoods. And in this case, countries like uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and others have become deeply engaged. And it's, it's grown since some of the changes in Egypt in 2012-13. And it has accelerated and intensified as the conflict in Yemen has intensified. The indicators or the, the examples of what I'm telling you are that Sudan shifted and joined the, the alliance with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, it has made certain political decisions to make sure that it works uh, more closely and meets, if you will, the standards and, and, and what were the criteria that were required for, for improving that relationship. In order to do that, or rather the consequence of that is that Sudan was a country that had become deeply isolated financially, including from some of its Arab uh, allies, because of its links to Iran and the like. 
Sudan now is dramatically less isolated. It doesn't mean it's free of the shackles of sanctions and the like, but it's found itself a room for maneuver, okay? which has a direct impact on how Sudan chooses to act on issues like the domestic political debates and so on and so forth, the, the national dialogue, its relations with South Sudan uh, and, and the like. So there's one. Second, uh, to the absolute astonishment of some who should have known better, uh, the United Arab Emirates suddenly announced some point last year, I remember when was it was in the summer, that it was opening up a base in the port of Assab. There'd been a, a differences with, um, with the government of Djibouti, and the next thing you know, the government of Eritrea offered Assab, mainly for Yemen and so on and so forth. Any of you who know the sensitivities of the issue, that something like this should have occurred is quite astonishing and shakes balances. The country of Eritrea, which had been isolated and there'd been a strategy of isolating it, including by a couple of its neighbors and Ethiopia and Djibouti, now suddenly find itself with a benefactor. It had become strategically useful. And I'm sure those deals don't come free of charge. It has therefore elevated itself. It's shaken the balances in the region. In Somalia, there has been for quite some time, and entirely naturally, let me add, a considerable engagement from, and lately from the Emirates, Qatar, um, and Saudi Arabia more recently. Turkey has been involved uh, for some time. Uh, and what we're seeing now is a more general pattern of this engagement. The, the interesting question is, and I, I speak having traveled in the Gulf a lot and dealing a lot with, with the Gulf, is what we're really talking about now is that we have to, you don't just take the horn and look at it simply in isolation, not just of its countries, but as a region, but begin to ask yourself whether the horn is not part of a more natural economic space which I would call a wider Red Sea region. Those are the, the natural relationships and trading relationships that have existed for centuries, centuries. So why don't we wake up and instead of being hostages to our own bureaucratic or orientalist definitions where you have an Africa department because it's the sub-Saharan Africa, and you have a North Africa and Middle East because that's, how can I put it, the Muslim world, the Arab world, and the like, redefine the geography because that's the real strategic goal and the strategic um, shape of things to come. And if one is interested about the security of, say, the Red Sea, then one has to engage and see that all the sides, not just the riparians, but those sitting even beyond the immediate shoreline, begin to engage each other so that they're not caught in a cycle of mistrust, of questioning, that then can result in an absolute mess where the region like the Horn can potentially be profoundly destabilized when, it, when I believe that if we open an, up an, a discussion that involves those countries of the Gulf, the countries of the Horn, and those others who have an interest, and I should add in there, China with its trade, the European Union, and well, European, all of us, um, the, the, the United States, everyone has a stake in this. But let's think creatively. Let's think of how we match economic incentive to begin to dissipate um, the political fragility and the political suspicions that exist. And there can, one can begin, if one is willing to do this sort of thinking and therefore this sort of diplomacy and politics, we will, I believe, begin to, sh to find a way into the future. My own 
objective for all of us, and it'll be long after I'm gone, but to lay the foundations for what I would call a platform of security and, co uh, security and economic cooperation in the wider Red Sea region. That's the natural economic and security zone. Build it, work at it, think big, and don't retail. Go strategically wholesale, look at the big picture. That means bringing the IFIs in. It means bringing the private sector in in a major way. It means committing to really smart diplomacy. Otherwise, we are going to get retailed to death. One day it's South Sudan. The next day it's a little problem on one village between two countries. And then the next it's some other problem. That is strategically distracting, politically exhausting, and it totally diminishes all our interests and opportunities. And I don't mean just European, everyone's. Now, can we move boldly in that direction? That is what I'm trying to persuade my own member states, the European Union, and also the countries in the region. Some argue that I'm being a Don Quixote, just totally quixotic. If you don't think big and you don't bring hope, go home and get a cup of tea as far as I'm concerned. So that's where I'm coming from. And it requires a lot of smartness, but I think vision, and try to put the two together and see if we can go. If not, this region will be left to the depredations of everyone. We've got a religious crisis growing. There's a radicalization occurring in this region, and it's creating counter-radicalizations. We've got the lack of economic growth. That has to be built up. We've got conflicts. These will feed on each other like an infection. It'll come to Europe at some point in the form of migrants. It may be terrorism. But the point is the region itself will have failed itself. And that's in no one's interest. And yet it has every opportunity, I think, to move beyond. And that what I think is for anyone who's committed, who, who, who cares for this region, and it goes beyond just one's interests. I think there's, there's reason, there's hope, there's opportunity if one is willing to be bold enough to be creative. And I don't mean condescending, and I don't mean joining the legions of white moralists who turn up telling the region how to be either this or that or that. It's a question of sitting down and saying, let's work out, let's get smart, let's really do business. Political business, security business, business business. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, big issues, big questions raised uh, on a big topic. So I guess there will be plenty of questions to be raised. Um, anybody? Okay, first we have Mark here. And when you raise the question, please also introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark Lantain from here at NUPI. To just inquire further about one of the points you made near the end about the increased interest in the region by um, outside powers, great powers. What we've seen over the past uh, year, China has announced that it is going to be setting up a military installation, its first outside of Asia proper in Djibouti, joining an American and a French base there. There's been very ambitious talk uh, about uh, Chinese investment in uh, communication, transportation, port facilities in Djibouti. And China is certainly not alone. Like there's a phrase that's very commonly used in policy circles, the revenge of geography. And Djibouti is now finding itself in a very interesting position, being seen as a crossroads of a lot of very important economic security issues. So my question is, how do you see uh, Djibouti and the greater uh, Horn of Africa region standing up to what is looking to be a very extensive amount of great power scrutiny. Thanks. Shall we, do you want to take them um, immediately or do you want a couple more first? Take a couple more? Okay, so it's uh, the lady up here. Mari um support group for Sudan and South Sudan. Um, you started asking if the Horn of Africa, including down to Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, could be one region, or in, if it's really a region. And um, then you concluded on um, defining the, the Red Sea region. 
would you still include all the way down to the what is now more or less called East Africa, the whole of East Africa, and the role of the African Union. It has strengthened itself over the last years and, and is very influential on African matters. Could you collaborate a little bit about the African Union, please? Okay, so I take uh, one more uh, gentleman behind there. Thank you, Arnel Jasufnelius from NRCI. We are a geopolitical risk consultancy. Uh, I was just traveling through the countries you've been talking about. I had the pleasure of being in Somalia, in Mogadishu, Juba, South Sudan, Sudan, Kenya, etc. And I've also been in the Middle Eastern countries. Uh, a few couple of questions specifically about Somalia. What concrete steps do you see being taken, taking Somalia forward? Uh, mentioning Vision 2016 or situation between Somaliland, Puntland, and Somalia. And what is really Amisom doing? Do you see that Amisom is a constructive force in Somalia? And if it's not, what can be done? Regionally, being in your position, could you also briefly comment on what you can say about, do you feel that regional actors are willing to talk together? And if it's going in the right direction, and not if it's not, what, what can be done? Thank you. In the region, you're talking about Somalia, Kenya, Ethiopia, Eritrea, the, well, you talk about the Red Sea. I totally agree with you, completely. Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and on the African side. I mean, is there a regional interest to really get this region forward, or is it not? And if in any way it's possible, what timeline are we talking about? Are we talking about a lost decade, two, three lost decades? Where are we going? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, you want to respond now? You have three. Sure. Okay, excellent. The China Djibouti, uh, there's no doubt China has engaged in a big way. It will. Its influence, I think, on the economy of Djibouti will be quite extraordinary. Um, how that will play out, I'm not sure, longer term. Uh, China equally is heavily engaged in Sudan, South Sudan. It, it's a big, big, big player. I think it, the region has long been interested and wanted to have that relationship. And I think it's just jolly, it's very good for them that as a region and individual countries try to diversify their sources. I think what is going to be very interesting for some countries, like China, is to begin to appreciate that a purely mercantile strategy can never ultimately avoid political consequences. And I think that's where um, the authorities in, in Beijing are beginning to understand this and are beginning to look at this. And um, I think this has implications to the way they look at the issues of security and it's no coincidence that China has actually sent it. There's a detachment in South Sudan, isn't there? I mean, we're seeing some very interesting changes. So it, it's the region, also in China. This is sort of, let's put it this way. I think it's work in progress. What the real effect will be, I don't know. But there's an awareness. And actually, there's an absolute willingness to discuss. Um, there's, there's, this is not a taboo subject at all. Um, as to its real consequences, I don't know. But this is a major player with major interests, to put it mildly. And this region, therefore, is of direct interest because it sits astride, if you will, a major route, as well as having certain uh, commodities uh, and, and resources which, which would be of interest to China. So that's on that one. Um, the, the, the Red Sea in East Africa, Yes, I mean, it, it's funny. It's, uh, to me, it's like a fluid fl front frontier. They, it sort of expands and contracts depending on how you want to see it. Uh, um, you know, as someone who's sort of devoted to history, you can't sit there and talk about, you know, he, 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 the, the Sultan of Oman all the way down to Zanzibar. Some things remain. There are links that remain. Um, 
the Indian notion, literal, is a natural and historical trading area. Okay, and it will continue to be. Uh, the, the risks of illicit trade, especially of drugs, now coming across the Indian Ocean from Pakistan and the like down into East Africa are multiplying by the month. All right? So there are links that are occurring. Therefore, there is all sorts of ways in which a sort of a cooperation would have to extend to this coast. Secondly, the East African coastline, the Swahili coastline, has become, I think there's some serious shifts happening with, with a lot of the population, especially with regard to religion. Um, that has to be, you know, there's something they're all going to cooperate and talk about at some point. Uh, and I think there's a natural economic tendency to link up. You know, I mentioned um, ports just simply to Mombasa, but you've got Lamu, but you've also got Dar es Salaam and others that are being constructed. So there's going to be competition as well in this. So I wouldn't, I, I, I have no particular um, model. I would say rather let that all develop as, and see where it goes, but you don't exclude a region from that. African Union, yes, co absolutely correct. African Union has made enormous strides. And since the creation of the Union, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we're seeing an attempt to really get organized and to have a direct impact on a variety of issues, not least, which is to give a sense of direct, of both direction and representation of, 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 of a continent that has a common heritage, especially of recent history. Um, and I think that's very, very important. Uh, secondly, I think the Union is becoming increasingly active on security issues. It's beginning to look at a set of trans, you know, or other continental questions and beginning to get focused. Now, the, the challenge it faces is to make sure that it has the means to, to match its vision. It, it, it's very simple. Um, and I think that that's the challenge that still has to be met. And part of it comes down very simply to if the, if the African Union wants to be able to do all these things, at what point does it begin to pay for it itself rather than be dependent on financing from outside? And I say that simply because I'm beginning to hear more and more leaders from Africa actually say, it's, we'll never have an equal relationship so long as, say, the European Union is paying for salaries of African civil servants at the AU. Um, and I think that's an absolutely natural thing to be discussed, and hopefully, gradually, they'll get to that. So I think that we're getting, it's just constantly moving forward and let's see where it goes. Uh, but we need to help the African Union just as we need to help the regional organizations um, within Africa. Uh, there, are, there, there are too many, if you will, regional specificities that cannot simply be managed from one location. And, and it's, whether it's ECOWAS, SADC, EGAD, East African community. And there again, there's a balance that will have to be found. And this you don't legislate that. You just shape gradually what this is. And, and, and I think it'll shift in time. But you know, Africa without the African Union is an Africa without an identity on the global stage. And it, need, it must have that. That's the voice. Um, now, Somalia, uh, what are the concrete steps? I think there are two, two or three things happening in Somalia that I would regard as, as, as progress. Uh, first of all, there is a commitment to a legislative process. That's fine. Uh, I'm not talking, I, I, I don't work in the business of perfection. I just don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the adequate, let alone the good. Okay, so some process of deliberation that will allow Somalis to feel that they are in, represented more fairly. They are represented from among the regions and not just by an elite sitting in Mogadishu 
These are some of the next steps. This is then linked to the second point, which is, if you will, the federal project, which seems to be taking shape. Uh, my own view is that that federal project is a natural next stage for Somalia. Wherever Somalia ends up, I don't know, in 10, 20, 30 years' time. But given the degree to which the country had broken down, these are the natural building blocks to build. And actually, it brings the politics a bit closer down. At what point a Somalia, there are those who are reluctant, who would rather it were much more centralized. But I see this at the moment as a natural step in going forward. Third, uh, on the security front, and it relates to your question on, on Amazon, uh, my own view is that Amazon has done a hell of a job. I'm in no doubt about that. And I'm aware that there are many Somalis, especially in election season, who would like to question that. But then I would ask the counterfactual, if there was no such presence that would have created the space to allow some vestige of politics to go on in Somalia, where would Somalia be? So the point, though, is uh, a mission like Amisom must never overstay its welcome. So the real question here is, how does Amisom move on? How does it make the transition? out of Somalia, how therefore is a Somali capacity to have security? And I don't mean simply a Somali army. Security, good police, judiciary at the local level, everything that constitutes the concept of security, national and human. How is that built up so that quickly we can move to a point where Somalia is able to be if you will, free of having a, a presence of a foreign force to provide security. There'll be many quibbles you'll hear about Amazon, but as far as I'm concerned, overall, it's there to do the right thing. However, it must, we are now at the stage where it must move beyond, and we must move beyond. And the responsibility there is not for the internationals. This is where I want to be real clear. Somali security, if we're going to get it, the Somali authorities need to wake up and start acting on it. I've been talking about four years, but I don't see much progress. So if, is it Somali-owned or isn't it? If it is Somali-owned, then I'd like to see the Somalis deliver and that the government delivers and not keep pointing the finger at others. Either it assumes its sovereign responsibilities or it doesn't, which means it must pay for its troops, it must do these things which, by the way, it has not done adequately. And why should your forces of a national army go and fight and be killed when you're not sure where you're going to get your salary? Or rather, your food is being given to you by other Africans who are sharing their rations. That's what happens. Okay. Now, it moves sometimes and improves others, but it needs, this needs to become standardized. And it needs a Somali army that has a standardized training, a doctrine, all these things that a national army has, but also the local policing must be built up. So we're getting in the right direction, but to me, that's the big challenge. And, to, and very often, the issue of Amazon becomes a distraction from the real issue, is build that security capacity so that the average citizen can feel safe and is not subject to the depredations of all sorts of protection rackets, masquerading either as clans, religious groups, or businesses, which you'd want for any country. So that, that's my um, take uh, on, on Somalia, on Amisom and those steps. Vision 2016 and all that, you know, great, lovely, but, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the meat and potatoes. Uh, the regional actors, uh, do they talk to each other? The answer is yes. You don't hear about it most of the time. You'll be surprised the telephone calls that are going on the whole time, the texting that goes on. So at one level, of course they are. But this is a region which, is at the outset, I said, is, is fraught with all sorts of to, with all sorts of reasons to have divisions among itself. And yet I'm astonished as I watch 
the pro are being discussed. South Sudan, absolutely fraught. The, the unity, not the unity, the very raison d'etre of, of EGAD began to be questioned. And what's interesting to me is that now we're seeing the members of EGAD, some of whom had very difficult discussions with each other and differences, are now beginning to coalesce around their interests. And so for those who get extremely impatient and want to micromanage a crisis, the fact in, is that in the historical frame. This is another test of a regional organization, which I suspect is going to emerge strengthened because they've got over their differences and they're going to start talking. And they may do more together on South Sudan, just as they do on Somalia, and we'll see other issues. So I think um, that you see that. There are all sorts of problems. But then, you know, sitting in the European Union, when I look at the discussions we have, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not about to sit and uh, pass judgment on differences that exist among countries. But the answer is yes, they do. And what's interesting is the degree to which increasingly they do. And increasingly they look for people to pass messages and so on and so forth. So yes, in a very practical sense, from a diplomatic, political point of view, there's much more than meets the eye. Much, much more. Okay, thank you. We have a couple more questions. First of the gentleman behind here. I'm uh, Odd Evian of Norwegian Church Aid. <clears throat> I'd like to reflect a bit on what is called the Khartoum process in relation to the region. Uh, this stabilization agenda, so to say, I mean, in view of the migration and, and the transit routes and kind of the shift in policy that EU, Norway, others are taking versus key actors in the region, it seems so, at least maybe from a position of big sticks to big carrots, uh, uh, quick wins on, on certain, or I sense a kind of shift from a root cause approach into uh, more low hanging fruits, quick wins on stabilization. Uh, and maybe from a kind of perspective of the SDGs and, and climate and all sorts of things, let's say, leave no one behind in development towards make them stay where they are. Uh, in view of the big thinking around the potential of the region, what type of consequence can this approach, if I'm right, I might be wrong, have? Thank you. And then it's, uh, yeah. Excuse me. Can you give me the <coughs> My name is uh, Holly Johansson, and I've been an old hand on Africa. Um, I was, it's very interesting listening to you, I must say. Um, but I would like to add and um, add a reflection on what is happening in the Arab Muslim world with regard to the destruction, destructive processes in that work in Libya, Iraq, Syria and the repercussions far beyond these three countries, uh, also Yemen, which in the long run will leave them in a situation of power decline, loss of power, loss of influence, while, and then I was puzzled by your lack of discussion of a country like Ethiopia, which dramatically has changed over the last 20 years in particular, for the better. Mm -hmm. And also if you look at Kenya, I think the experience with the Uhuru regime is better than was expected by many. Tanzania, there is definitely a continuing process of betterment. So there in, in, in the region, there are, you, you, you talk a lot about those countries which, which are fragile or failed, but there are some that represent um, promise, progress, change for the better.
And then one last question from the lady behind here. Um, thank you so much for the, uh, your take on um, the region. Uh, my name is Nasri Omer. I work for the Norwegian Refugee Council. And I'm in interested to know, you mentioned that the private sector was booming in, um, in the case of Somalia. So I was wondering how we can um, reduce the gap between the humanitarian um, aid and development uh, to, to make things work. Um, and I also have a question about the, um, the um, climate change that is uh, going on in the region. Uh, there's a terrible drought in, in Ethiopia and in, in the uh, northern um, parts of Somalia. Uh, I wonder to know how serious is the climate change and its impact on the region being addressed in um, by the leaders of the countries and also by regional actors as EGAD. Okay. Um, yes, uh, I have no more uh, on the list. Um, so I think you can just take the three ones and... Hmm. Cartoon process and in fact, that ties in also with the last question. Uh, you know, from root causes to low-hanging fruit. Uh, here's, here's my blunt take on this. There's political reality that we have to deal with. Okay. Uh, if you want root causes, it takes a hell of a long time to eventually get to the roots and make them healthy. In political terms, this just ain't good enough because there's a ravenous electorate saying, show us something now. Right? That doesn't answer the moral question, but I'm addressing the political reality. So how do you thread this needle in policy terms? There's absolutely no way you can sacrifice the long-term commitment to addressing the the causes of what is migration, which is in effect all sorts of things from conflict to poverty, marginalization, oppression. We can go through the list. That has to continue. I think there's, there is a set of shorter term instruments, but also this may be required. What it's doing is a wake up call, I think, for Europe to ask itself a series of questions. One is, has it done development well enough? Has it defined development well enough? The lady just mentioned the private sector. Why do we always address root causes with development instead of saying, let's find a way of financing a burgeoning private sector? I know of businessmen who say to me, my God, give me credits, give me access to the bank, and I'll have you 500 jobs created, and quickly, and honestly. Right? Are we being creative enough? Are we scaling up or are we still, or are we victims of what, not, are we hostages of perhaps our own anachronistic thinking? Are we using old wine in a new bottle? I'm asking all these questions without having the answers, but I'd feel obliged to ask them. If, if, for instance, the European Union, we in the West, somehow think we're gonna address migration by either quick fixes or old medicine, neither is going to work. So m my bigger point is, how do we sit back and say, perhaps it's time to rethink a lot of things, okay? including the type of open conversation one can have with governments and society in, in the countries. So that's the consequence, ideally, I'd like to see that emerges from this. Because right now, I feel it's like every time you, you sort of collide with reality, it's the shock. I mean, it's in political terms, this migration crisis is some, like someone, you're getting a huge punch in the face, and then immediately someone turns around and says, now let's talk. Well, actually, you've got to recover from that and then talk. 
and in political terms, that's what I sense I see. Um, and this is what Europe's going through. Uh, whether, whether the punch is self-induced or not is another matter. This is objectively what's happening. So the cartoon process and, and the like, it's a raft. There are projects, there are ideas, and so on and so forth. There's money being put into it. What is clear to me is that if one doesn't, in fact, ramp up real smart investment long term that creates jobs, creates greater equity, makes sure for equitable results, which gets you into governance, we won't make much progress. In that, I'd be looking very carefully at what are the streams of financing. Does it always have to be ODA? How about private sector? I would right now be mobilizing the private sector of Europe to engage in order to enha enhance the money available. Some, some larger and better results. I don't know, but I test it. Secondly, there's a security debate going on. We need to look at that. What does security mean in Africa? Um, go through all of these things. Then there's short-term stuff. My own personal view is, yes, people are coming to Europe. And there's a risk that now that the, the route across the Aegean may be closing down, that they'll suddenly will see a, a surge up through Libya and the latest incident, terrible incident yesterday or the day before. So we have to ask ourselves, how do we a, a way forward on this? No, it's, um, forward on this that allows us actually to have a longer term effect by using some short term measures. What is it that will prevent people now moving? That will give them the incentive to stay? Questions to ask of Eritrea, of Somalia. Um, to what extent do people want to take the risk of coming all the way across? To what extent have they been seduced by traffickers? I don't know, but have they, is the question. To what extent can we get the cooperation among the security people in the region to help absolutely eliminate traffickers? Trafficking is part of organized crime. If they're not doing humans, they're doing drugs, they're doing guns, or I don't know what. Okay. And they're doing it, and let me say this clearly on the record, invariably under the noses of and in compliance with some of those in governments. Someone's taking a commission. And this is not an African monopoly. Wherever there is illicit trade, there is official indulgence of it. Someone's benefiting. This is about corruption, in other words, but an insidious form of corruption. How then do we begin to tackle that now? What I mean is, how do we get a bit more forensic and focused in our discussion? We're not going to resolve this migration question by going and talking root causes. We'll be doing it for the next 10 years. How do we have the types of discussion around the issues I've raised in order that we may end up having something that is not about simply Europeans being satisfied, and if I may put it really bluntly, being satisfied that fewer people who are African are not, are, are not turning up. And I won't go further in saying what my attitude to that attitude is. Okay. The issue is, what is the benefit that can eventually derive within Africa? And how can we do it with short, sharp activities now? If it is all about simply saying, we want fewer Africans turning up, you know what? A lot of African countries will turn around and say, you know, we've got some other problems. This is yours. Go smoke a pipe, send us a postcard when you want to think again. Right? That, that's political reality. That's the challenge politically right now. How do we take what, what you, you were saying, you know, this, the low-hanging fruit, which is another way of saying expedient projects. How do you take those and perhaps take the moment 
to see if actually there can be some real policy change. That's the challenge to me. Because I find the discussion about, you know, root causes and this and that, it, if I may, if, if, if you'll allow me, I find it, we've got to leap beyond that and ask ourselves more constructively, how do we move? What do we do? How do we seize the moment for the greater good? And not just to protect Europe's sense of identity, whatever in heaven's name that is. Okay? Or rather, which certain people seem to have a rather clear and rebarbative view of what their identity is. Now, um, climate change. Uh, too much rain, too little drain, rain, our government's on top of it. Exactly 30 years ago, I was in Ethiopia burying dead Ethiopian children who died of hunger. That's what changed my life. I am in Ethiopia today with a crisis of the same magnitude, and I'm not burying Ethiopian children. That is the measure of the achievement of this country. And no one can ever take that away from them. And I'm sorry, yes, the government makes mistakes on the way it manages some of its politics, and we can go on and on. But a child alive is a child alive. And you give that to that government, and you give them due. Because if you want to talk human rights, in my book, that's human rights. That's where I'm coming from. That's my own personal view. That's what motivates me. Is the whole of the region handling it properly? I'm impressed by one thing, that I'm not hearing, unless I'm, I'm out of touch, I'm not hearing about famine. Do we have an increase in mortality? We may have morbidity rates increasing, but do we have a rise in mortality rates, especially among uh, infants, you know, the classic uh, categories? If we don't have mortality, then something is happening. Someone is getting access to whatever goods to allow them to stay alive. Is it being done efficiently? I can't speak. I, frankly, I'm not close enough at the moment to judge. Because basically, I fast everyone say, just tell me if it's, not, if it's getting worse or if there's indicators. I think the government of Ethiopia is confronted by a major challenge. Um, and when I compare to what I knew then and then subsequent years back and then now, more recently, there's a real effort. There's no doubt. Are there inefficiencies and the like? My goodness, you know, the United States has trouble handling Katrina. The Ethiopian government has a right to make mistakes too, if it if it is making mistakes. Um, and I don't mean to be flippant about this, but we must beware of perfection, seeking perfection here. I think there's a will to get it right. There's awareness that there's this hideous legacy in the past, and I think there's a real effort. I'm desperately worried about South Sudan. I mean, profoundly concerned. And, and as far as I am concerned, this is a country whose political leadership has put its citizens to the sword. It has brutalized its children. It has violated its women. It has given license. And along the way, it has denied them. It has denied the right of access to just basic goods, which is another way of saying, if we can't get help in, people are going to die. Leave aside the fact that they're already dying at the moment. There's a total, total collapse that has occurred. And I'm not sure yet whether that degeneration has, is gathering momentum or slowing down. And I think, you know, my good friend Ian Speth and I, we often sit up and just ask ourselves this. That in which we'd invested such hope is shattered, and we've got to ask ourselves all these questions. But South Sudan, I worry about. Somalia's got a serious problem, too. But I think access, transport, logistics can manage this. And this time round, Shabab will not make the mistake it did last time. It will allow aid to go through if, if this is needed. And if it doesn't, it will have made a huge mistake, but also killed a lot of Somalis. Um. And the changes. You, you're absolutely right. There are poles around which one can build. And we've got to. And, and my mistake was, not in, I, was in taking it for granted rather than expressing it. This is, this is what lies behind my 
eventual optimism, the progress that you see in an Ethiopia, that I, as far as I'm concerned, I see a state is being built in, in the proper way. Whatever reservations certain people may have. In Kenya, yes, sometimes, let's just say, um, the mercantilism is rather enthusiastic. But, boy, that's a vibrant place. Um, when you look at Tanzania, the way it's made this it shift, it's shifted its course, absolutely, in all of these countries. And we've got to build on this, because I think they will have the demonstration effect, each in different ways. They'll go down their path. So I, I absolutely agree with you. And we've got to be very smart, and we've got to do something else. Uh, we must be um, economical in the Byzantine sense of the word. If we ask of them that they meet standards which in the end undermine or risk creating a problem for the overall forward trajectory, we will be hurting them. Yes, there will be questions every time there's an election. But is the country moving generally in the right direction? Is the question I would ask, and that there's much more to it. So, I would the question, the way I'd put it is: We who have to involved in policy, we have to be careful that our policies and our relations with countries in Africa are not subject to what I would call rather paro parochial monomanias, meaning single interest lobbies. You either have the commercial. You have the human rights, you have the security, you have this, you have that. And at the end of the day, one's got to manage a way forward on this. And I think this is where we are now, and the countries that you raise are perfect examples of how you can possibly move into a higher gear. And that will drag others along, and that means helping them talk more to each other, we engage um, much more. So. I think there's, there's some really interesting additional thinking one needs to do. Because certainly when you compare with what's happened in Libya, Syria, Iraq, and the like, uh, here are countries, you know, I keep telling people, it is amazing. When I began this work four years ago, every, it was all Somalia. Now people don't even talk about Somalia. The dangerous issue is that they actually believe that Somalia is doing well enough that they shouldn't think about it anymore. <laughs> There's a certain danger in that. Um, but it's, it's a sign of, of how things are moving. So I just want to just, you're absolutely right. Of course, there's promise. And that's the basis upon which I would, I would move ahead. And it, it, that's the raw material that they have. And the leaders of those countries have to take that. It's such a precious commodity that they have. And, and help shape it. Because that will draw the others. Into that, into that overall uh, momentum. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I was, yeah, I was supposed to wind up and uh, and uh, thank uh, all of you for coming, raising good questions, uh, and also to thank uh, Alexander uh, Rondos for coming here. Uh, it was a great pleasure. But uh, you came uh, me in advance and giving him the big hand. So thanks.